This morning I'm doing something a little unusual in that I've asked Kevin, serves as our pastor of discipleship, to speak this morning, to share his heart with you as it relates to uh, our, our, our ministries here at our church. And, uh, you know, God is blessing in so many ways, but uh, he's very much aware of opportunities and the need uh, for us as Christ followers to serve. And uh, he's going to help us through the study of God's Word do that. And I've asked him because uh, he's in tune with really what's going on uh, in the life of our church. Uh, and uh, this is the area that he oversees. It's a vast area of ministry. Uh, the number of volunteers that are required to do what we do every week and throughout the week as we're trying to effectively minister to those that God is bringing to our church. So without saying anything else, Let's welcome Kevin, all right? Thank you, Pastor Mark. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 21. And while you're doing that, if you would allow me just a moment, uh, I'm always humbled and appreciative of the opportunities that Pastor Mark gives me to speak when he's out. Uh, and today, to have an opportunity while he's in the building, uh, someone who is as polished and seasoned and such a strong leader as he is, for him to give me an opportunity to speak is very humbling, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's pray, ask God to help us as we study his word in Luke 21. Father, as I think about the song that we just sang, here's our heart, speak what is true. God, we do want to hear what you would say to us. Whatever it is that you want to communicate to us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, look, God, we want to hear it. Help us, Lord, to want to do it. Sometimes it's easy for us to hear and more difficult for us to do. God, I pray that both of those things would be accomplished this morning through the power of your spirit as your word goes forward. We do pray for understanding. We pray that you would help us in this time. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how much thought you've ever given to what it takes for all the ministries of the church to function at their highest level, and particularly what it takes by way of volunteer leaders, people serving in those ministries. And I don't know the exact number myself because it ebbs and flows, but I know it's an awful lot, several hundred in fact. If our ministries were to function at their highest level, firing on all cylinders, if you will, it takes a lot of people serving in those ministries. It takes a lot of committed people serving, not just people who are involved. You know, as I think about the difference between involvement and commitment, I think about an old illustration related to breakfast. I, about a year ago, I changed my habits, uh, some for the good, some not so much, but I've begun to eat a pretty standard breakfast of bacon and eggs every morning. As I look at that plate in the mornings, I'm reminded that there were two animals that were somewhat involved in that breakfast, but not at the same level. There's a chicken that's involved, but not quite at the same level that the pig is involved. You might say that the chicken is involved and the pig is committed. More has to been, had to have been given up by that pig for me to enjoy my breakfast each morning. Listen, in the church, we need people who are involved, we need people who are committed, and we need them at a high rate. Otherwise, our ministries simply can't function at their highest level. You've heard Pastor Mark share before, <clears throat> and I'll just, I'll just witness to it, attest to it, that this happens uh, not often, but regularly, as one of our ministry values as a church is ministry excellence, and that's something that we really do play out in staff meetings, in strategy conversations about what ministries we need to, to fire up, new ministries, what ministries we need to undergird. And the question often comes to this, well, it's a good ministry. We think it can affect a lot of people, but we, do we have the people who are committed to run the ministry and to do it well and to be committed to it? Because it doesn't do a lot of good to fire up a ministry if there's not a strong base of people who are committed and trained to fulfill that ministry. That's just a reality. So it really does take a lot of committed people to fulfill the ministries of the church here. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, as Pastor Mark alluded to. He began a sermon series last week called I'm All In, and he talked about how we need to be serving with a purpose, with a heart for servant leadership. And this morning, I want to talk about this idea of serving as sacrifice. 
because committed service is certainly sacrificial service. And the passage I'd like to use this morning is Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And then I'd like to share with you several points that will help us to understand what it requires of us if we are to serve sacrificially. <clears throat> so Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And so it raises this question. Does Jesus get from us just what we have left out of our abundance? After we expend our time and our energy and our resources on things that we want, we give him what's left. Or does he desire, does he deserve more from us? <clears throat> so that our serving is sacrificial. If we are to serve the Lord sacrificially, this requires several things of us. I'd like to share those with you this morning. Number one, serving sacrificially requires me to honestly evaluate my situation and my resources. Serving sacrificially requires me to honestly evaluate my situation and my resources. The Bible says that she gave out of her poverty. That was her situation. That was her situation. She, she lived in poverty. Now, if we think about situation and resources, we might define them in this way. Your situation includes external realities that accurately describe your context. The things going on around you that requires of you some sort of energy or some sort of resource that you need to invest in. And it ebbs and flows in life. Wouldn't you agree? Sometimes we're busier than other times. Our contexts change. And sometimes our context, our situation, does require us to pull back from or to lower our involvement in ministries so that we can tend to a need. When that happens, however, it's usually for a short season of time, not permanently. Some context in which we find ourselves that may require us to, to, to pull back a little bit may include certain life circumstances. Some of you here this morning may be caring for an ill family member. And that's requiring more of you than it did before. And so because of that, because of that legitimate need, that, that ministry to your own family, and the scripture says that we're to take care of our families, because of that, perhaps you need to step back a little bit from ministry. Maybe some of you have an expanded role at work, and that's pretty new to you. And either you're putting in a lot more hours on the clock, or maybe you have the same amount of hours, but you have more responsibilities, so when you come home, you're just more exhausted, and there's an adjustment period that needs to take place. Still others may be uh, seeing your family enlarged through adoption or, or birth, and so your family's growing, there's, there's more required of you with young children, and so those are things that happen around us that we need to be honest about because we're not unlimited creatures. We're finite, in fact. God has created us that way, and there are things that do take more energy. Those are situations around us. A resource in this context is something that I possess or have access to that will give me what I need to endure, persevere, or overcome that situation. So there's, there's balance, right? There's a situation over here that's requiring much of us, then there are resources over here that are, that are allowing us to meet that situation. And if the situation is larger than our resources, we often feel overwhelmed. We don't want to get in that situation. You have three gas tanks in your life. You have a physical tank, you have a spiritual tank, and an emotional tank. If any of those get empty, you've reached a state of burnout. And that's not good. And yet, we want to be careful that we don't just focus on the situation because there will always be busyness in life. There will always be something going on that we could look at and say, I can't serve now because this. We must also look at the resources that God has given us to overcome. The widow certainly knew her situation. She had no money. She lived in poverty. She had two coins and faith. And out of that, she activated her faith. Listen, she was aware of her poverty. It's not as though she woke up that morning, reached in her pocket, thinking she had a lot of money, and thought, oh my goodness, I've only got two coins. No doubt she was aware of her poverty. To be a widow was to be extremely vulnerable in society. 
Not only did she not have a husband who could help care for her, she had no real means of earning an income to provide for her basic needs. She was very vulnerable. She understood her situation, and yet that did not keep her from acting in faith where she felt God wanted her to act. She faithfully responded. Her faith was a catalyst to her action. Any faith that's real, that's vibrant, that's worth anything will lead us to action. That's biblical in multiple places. Maybe no more clear than in James where he says faith without works is dead. And then any true act of faith is costly. Think about that for a second. It's, it costs us something to practice faith. Usually it costs us our sense of control or our sense of security. Now I, I highlight that word sense because we're never really in control. We never really control our own security or have full security outside of the Lord, but we have a sense of it. And we don't want to give up that sense of control, our sense of security, and that often keeps us from exercising our faith because we're focusing on the realities around us, our poverty, our lack of resources, when we need to also focus on the other side. So we have to honestly evaluate our situation and our resources. If we don't give a true assessment, we're probably going to overemphasize the situation and underemphasize the resources that God has given us. Now, we don't want to under, undersell our situation. We don't want to live recklessly or foolishly. That's not faith. So, for example, sacrificial serving does not mean that we should say yes to everything that comes our way. It doesn't mean that every time you receive a phone call or a contact from someone who asks you to serve in a certain way that you're compelled to say yes. Again, we are, in fact, limited people. That's just the reality that we live with. And if we undersell the situation around us, we're likely to live foolishly. But on the other side, let's not live as people who have no faith. Trusting that God will provide for us whatever it is that we need to fulfill the ministry that he might be calling us to fulfill. But rather than living foolish, we need to be intentional about the consideration of ministry opportunities that come before us because there are so many. And for the church, again, to function at its highest level in ministry, both inside the walls and outside in the community, it takes an enormous amount of committed people, Christians who have given our lives to Christ for the work of his service. So sacrificial living is an intentional investment of precious, limited resources for a greater purpose. And resources are limited. Her resources were limited. She had two coins. That's what she had. She didn't have more. And they were precious and they were important, but she felt it was important to give them to God as an offering. She lived sacrificially. We need to have a sacrificial attitude toward serving. It will cost us something. To activate our faith in the area of service, it will cost us something. Our sense of security, our sense of control, our sense of, 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 of comfort, because it kind of forces us to get out of our comfort zone, maybe try something new. Any ministry that you're involved in is a sacrifice. Whatever it is you do, if you sing in the choir, if you help in the kitchen, if you teach a kid's life group, an adult life group, it requires something of you. If you get up and go to a different context, whether it's across town or across the globe, that requires a certain amount of sacrifice. And those are examples of what God would have us to do. Not focusing only on the situation, but also on the resources that we have. So we have to give an honest evaluation of both of those. Secondly, we need to have a vibrant faith that relies on God's provision. A vibrant faith that relies on God's provision. The scripture says that she gave all that she had to live on. And so many people would look at that and think, what are you doing? Why would someone do that? Why would you give up everything that you have to live on? Why would you invest that time or that, that, that energy in a ministry when it's so precious to you? When you have so precious little time or energy, why would you do that? And the answer is that she was convinced that God could provide for her what she needed. And so she lived by conviction. Probably, we don't know this, but probably based upon experience. 
She trusted God because he had come through for her before. And she believed that obedience was the way to go, even if it was sacrificial, even if it cost her something. She had no backup plan, no safety net. If we believe the scripture, and we always can, this is all that she had. It's all she had to live on. There wasn't anything else. There was no plan B. She wasn't anxious about this life. She was anxious about being obedient. She sought the kingdom first. Because there wasn't a backup plan for her. When's the last time you allowed your faith to be stretched so far to the point that you knew if God didn't do something, you'd be in trouble? We don't like to live there, do we? None of us do. Because we like our comfort and our security. I do too. I'm with you. When I... I came to, I think I've told you, I came to Christ when I was 15. Uh, by the time I was 17, God had called me into ministry, and I'll t- talk more of that in a minute because I wasn't interested in it at that time. But uh, one of the first opportunities I had to speak publicly, uh, I, I sat down with the pastor at the time, and I said, hey, give me some pointers. I have no idea how to do this. Um, and he said, so he wrote down some things on a card. And one of the things he said, he said, Kevin, 95% of the time I'm preaching to myself. So I'll think of a question that I need to answer, and I'll try to answer it for people. And I'm speaking to myself with this. Hear me. Hear my heart. I, too, like to be comfortable. I, too, don't like to be stretched. And yet that's often what our faith requires is for us to be stretched because there is when we really know and understand and experience the faithfulness of God. It's part of his working in our heart and in our life. We need to be stretched. Hebrews 11, which is a chapter you're familiar with, even if you don't know you're familiar with it, it's where you see the roll call of the heroes of faith. These men and women who stood up and and expressed serious faith in dire situations. And among them is a nobody by the name of Gideon. You say, Kevin, that's awful mean of you to call him a nobody. Well, that's basically what he called himself. When when the angel of the Lord comes to him uh, in Judges chapter 6, Uh, Gideon responds and says, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. I come from a clan of nobodies, and I'm the least in that clan. I'm a nobody of nobodies. I got nothing that I can do. And yet when the angel comes to him, he says to him, Be brave, mighty warrior, because God saw something in Gideon that Gideon didn't see in himself, and he was willing to use Gideon, desired to use Gideon, if Gideon would just yield and follow the plan of God. And so Judges 6 and Judges 7 become this fascinating look at how God uses this nobody who was from nowhere to accomplish a great thing. One of the things that uh, God tells Gideon to do in preparation for saving the nation is to tear down the altar of Baal. Gideon responded in faith, but what I want you to hear is that he did have fear even though he also had faith. Listen to verse 27 of chapter 6. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men in town to do it by day, he did it at night. He was too afraid to do it at day, so he did it at night. Faith is not the total absence of fear or anxiety. It's the willingness to push through that fear or that anxiety. It's the willingness to stand and say, God, I have no idea how you're going to come through, and I I don't see it, and I'm I'm concerned about it, but I'm trusting you to come through however this works out. I do have fear, but I'm pushing through that fear to get to a place of faith. So Gideon sets out at the command of God with about 32,000 men, and God says, that's too many men. And Gideon must have thought to himself, what do you mean it's too many men? God says it's too many, so he whittles it down to about 10,000 to go take on this mighty army. And in chapter 7, verse 4, Gideon's preparing for battle, and God comes again and says, Gideon, you've still got too many people. And Gideon must have thought his hearing was bad. But it wasn't, because God says, I'm going to do this. He says, if I give you too many people, if you have too many resources, people are going to think that you're doing this and not me, but I want them to know that I'm doing it. So Gideon ends up with 300 men, and to make matters worse, the only weapons weapons that they have are a torch, a trumpet, and some pitchers to put over the torches. That's all they had, and a vibrant faith, that God was able to do what God said he was going to do. If we're going to serve sacrificially, we have to have a vibrant faith that relies on the provision of God to provide for us what we need to accomplish that act of service in front of us. If we don't have that, we'll always have our attention on the situation 
and not on the resources that God has provided. And most of the time, we'll conclude it's not worth it. I can't handle it. I'm too busy. I'm not prepared for that. Remember, there's all, all, there will always be a reason to say no. Look for a reason to say yes to the Lord. The third thing that we need to keep in mind as it relates to sacrificial serving is that I need to do what I can do and not worry about what others can or cannot do. This widow boldly goes to give her offering in a setting where others were able to give much, much more. The Bible says that Jesus saw the rich giving their offering and he also saw her. And there is some disagreement as to the exact setting. It was, this was probably in the, 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 the women's court of the temple complex, but it was a public place. And there's some disagreement as to whether that she would have come in and given her offering to a, a, a caretaker, and the caretaker would have looked at it and called out publicly, this is what she's given. If that's the case, she would know that hers would be called out, and she would know that the, the offering given by these folks who have more resources to give would be called out, and she would probably stand there embarrassed. Some people think that wasn't the case. Some people think she came in and maybe dropped it in what was the ram's horn and it would have bounced around. They could have heard it. Either way, it would have been relatively clear to people that this woman didn't have much. And when they stood up, they had a lot. And so she could have been intimidated by that. But rather, she focused not on what she didn't have, but on what she did have. And I'm giving to the Lord what I have and what other people are given is their business. Um, I remember going to a, a retreat when I was in college, and this was one of those times where God really formed me. You know, if you think about your Christian life, you'll see where God teaches you certain lessons along the way. And I, I believe I learned this particular lesson at about this time. I'd gone to a conference with our college group uh, to the CMO BSU. It was uh, in Rome, Georgia. Henry Blackaby was speaking, and the emphasis, the thrust of the conference was sharing our faith and evangelism. And so there, that, that was the, the two days of teaching was about that. The teaching was fantastic. And it was really a rah-rah for winning your campus for Christ. So at the end, the last, the last session, there was one of these committal things where the, the speaker said, hey, if you're committed to go back and win your campus for Christ, we want you to stand up. So what does everybody do at that point? They all stand up. Here was the problem that I had. I had spent some time in prayer uh, in the little prayer room that week, or that weekend, I should say, uh, they had it set up just so you could go and you could pray about things. And God was doing something completely different in my life at that time. I was focused on something completely different, not evangelism. I wasn't against evangelism, right? But that's just not where God had me at the moment. So when that time at the end came up, I was faced with a decision. I can stand up with the rest of the group, and no one will ever know what I've been, what I've been going through in my life. I shouldn't say going through. It wasn't a bad time. But what God was dealing with me about in my life is a better way to say it. I could have stood up and no one would have ever known it. But I, but I thought to myself, I'm not going to do that. Because I, I'm not going to compare what God's doing with me with what God's doing with them. So I sat there while, I don't know, a couple thousand, three, four thousand college students stood up. And I'm sure they thought I was an idiot. Maybe they still do. But what I learned at that time was, you know what, Kevin, I'll deal with you wherever I'm dealing with you. And don't worry about what I'm doing with other people. That's my business with them. And that's part of what I think is going on here. We've got to do what we can do, not worry about what others can do. Listen, the enemy is a deceiver. And if he can deceive us into believing that we have nothing of value to offer in the way of service and therefore sideline us, keep us from being active in the kingdom of God, serving in the church, he'd be very happy to do that. That'd be a win for him. But you need to understand that that's not the truth. That's not what the scripture says. It, it, there's two issues that, that we can talk about here. One is insecurity and one is pride. Insecurity says something like, I have nothing really to offer. And therefore, I'm not going to do anything. I really can't go into that class and teach that group of kids. I, I really can't participate in that mission trip. I, I just don't, I'm not that skilled, I'm not that qualified, I'm not that patient, whatever it is. Most of the time, by the way, that's not humility. It's insecurity. Not trusting that God will give you what you need. The other issue is pride. And pride says something like this, you know, that really is not worth my time. 
I've got too many more important things to do than to serve in that way or to fulfill that task. Paul addresses those in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me read this kind of lengthy passage, but if you'll bear with me, I think it'll be worth our time. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 15 through 26. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And to our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for each other. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. God, in his sovereignty, has brought together the body of Christ. In one sense, he's done so on a global level, that it, when we belong to Christ, we're put into the global church. On another sense, there's a local level. And if you're a believer, and this is where you think that God has called you to attend, whether you're a member or not, then he's also given you a, a, a spiritual gift that you are to invest in the edification of the church. And therefore, it becomes a matter of stewardship. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to focus on the situation that might keep you from doing it or on the resources that God has given you, one of those being a spiritual gift for the specific purpose of fulfilling that role within the body of the church? A couple things that I underlined that I'll point out from here. In verse 18, God arranged the members in the body, each one as he chose. So it's not for me to say, gosh, I wish I had that gift. If I could just do that, I'd stand up and do it. Don't focus on what others can do. Focus on what God's called you to do. And then in verse 24, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. None of us are ever too good, quote unquote, to fulfill a task for the Lord. And we need to be careful of both of those, insecurity and pride. Two ends of the, of the spectrum, perhaps, but both very dangerous in our thinking, a tool used by the enemy to keep us from being active and sacrificially serving within the body of Christ. Fourth, we need to rethink abundant living. What is abundant living anyway? For many, abundant living has a very earthy meaning. All of these people, the Bible says, have put in gifts out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty. From an earthly perspective, their surplus, would, there's, there's this abundance there's an abundance there. Surplus, but she gave out of her poverty. They gave more by way of an amount, but she gave more by way of portion. She gave all she had, 100%. She's all in. She's committed. They gave a portion out of their surplus. Now, of course, this passage is talking about giving financially, but the application is beyond that. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? Do we just bring our, bring our money to church and assume that it goes into heaven? I mean, certainly we give our tithes and we give our offerings and that helps to... to uh, to, to, to spread the gospel, for us to, to do the ministries, that's a part of it. Yes, we're to do that. We are to tithe and we're to, we're to give sacrificially, financially. But beyond that, how do we store up treasures in heaven? Paul says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Doing good, acts of service. 
That's how we store up treasures in heaven. We need to understand that a sacrificial life is an abundant life. Abundance is not primarily related to your checking account. Abundance, abundant rewards are often relational. God has created us to live in relationship. Life is better together. We talked about that earlier, and you'll see more about life groups coming out next week because we think that life is better together, and there we find abundance. Joy is often in the battle, in the stress, in the striving, and in the ultimate victory by Jesus Christ, although that won't come until later when we get into heaven. But now joy is in the battle, and we need to understand and embrace this idea that a sacrificial life is an abundant life. We also need to learn to value something or someone more than ourselves if we are to embrace sacrificial serving. Why would this widow give up such a sacrificial offering? The reason, because she valued God more than she valued her money. Why would someone give up their time to invest in ministry leadership, to invest in serving? because we value God and his will for our life above our own time. Serving in church requires us, all of us, to place less value on consuming ministry and more value on leading ministry, let me clarify. When you think about consuming ministry, that's an important part of what we do, and we should all be consumers of ministry in this way. We come in on Sunday morning, we participate in large group worship. We, 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 we take in, and it, well, it's not really fair to say we take in worship. We, we do Bible intake as part of it. As Pastor Mark comes and he shares the word, we listen and we respond to it. But that's active as well, right? We don't just sit and listen to the songs that the, the choir sings and that Pastor Gabe sings. We actively are part of that process. Worship is both formative and expressive. All that is, ha is happening at one time. But you might say that's a, a way of consuming ministry. We go to a life group and we hear a, a teacher talk, and so we consume that experience. And listen, that's good. We want more of that. We need more of that. That's why we're expanding our life group ministry. That's why we put so much emphasis on what happens on Sunday morning. But we also have to understand that we take what we've consumed and then we use it to lead others in ministry to help them get closer to the Lord, to grow in their faith. If we have a situation where we're all just consuming ministry and no one is doing ministry, it doesn't require too much hard thinking to see that that's a problem. We need to help others to grow in their faith. Philippians 2, 4, everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We have to value that more than we value what we want personally. Sixth, and finally, in order for us to live a life of sacrificial service, we need to embrace God's purpose, his plan, over our own purpose. Earlier, I referenced a time when I was 17 and God was calling me into ministry. Uh, I was saved when I was 15. By the time I was 17, I began to sense pretty strongly that God wanted me to go into ministry, and I wanted no part of it. I wasn't interested in that. Uh, and I remember thinking, hey, um, I, I've got this, this particular profession in mind that I want to pursue, and my primary motivation was the paycheck that it came with. That's what I wanted, a little prestige, a little, uh, nice paycheck. I wanted a you know, big house and all those nice things. And that was my motivation in life. Over the next two years, God worked in my heart so that when I was 19, he convinced me that my best shot at quote-unquote happiness was not in that prestigious profession that might give a large salary, but rather and it, was, it was in embracing his purpose for my life. And I distinctly recall at the age of about 19, thinking to myself with this thought, God, I trust you that whatever it is you have for me in ministry will take me to a, a better place than this particular job that I was seeking. I'm yielding to your purpose over my own. And each of us has to do that often. 
we yield to God and we say, God, I'm going to embrace your purpose. I've got these lists of wants, these lists of priorities that are important to me, but I really need to understand what you desire for me and pursue that. And so 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. There's the, according to his purpose, which I've already talked about, but what about his grace? In what way does his, does, do, do purpose and grace work together? Listen, if you've ever served in any capacity, and almost all of you have, you know that God works in your heart when you're serving him and serving other people. God, in his grace and in his wisdom, uses our serving as part of our sanctification. He forms us, he shapes us, he grows us more into the image of Jesus Christ as we're serving him. And so we yield to his purpose and we embrace the grace that he is showing us in Jesus Christ as we grow more in Christ's likeness. But we've got to get to a place where we say, God, I believe that your purpose is better for me than my own purpose. And so I'm going to yield and follow your will. So the sermon series title is, Are You All In? Are you committed? Are you open to sacrificially serving in the coming weeks? Sacrifice means it costs you something. And we understand that. But we also believe that that's what God's called us to do. So in a moment, we'll have a time of invitation, and you'll have an opportunity to respond in different ways. But one of the things I'd like for you all to do, and you can do this in your seat or standing in a moment, would you commit over the next seven days, as part of your devotional time each day, would you spend a little bit of time praying, just asking God, God, is there some place that I need to be serving you that I'm not? And just be open to his moving in your life. Whatever your situation is, whatever the reality of your context is, and how overwhelming it feels, would you just go before the Lord for seven days and say, God, if there's some place that I need to be serving, would you show me? Because I want to do that. And it might be that you're already involved in ten different ministries. Would you still pray that? Because the reality is, we don't just need people who are serving, we need people who are serving in the right place. Because God may be saying, you've served here for a while, now it's time to go over here. And I hope that you'll all take that challenge. But for others, as we have an invitation time in a moment, we want to give you an opportunity to respond, perhaps in a different way. Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, before I commit to serving, I need to know more about what it means to commit to Jesus Christ. To have my sins forgiven and be reconciled to the Father. We'd love to help you with that. If you want to come forward during the invitation, we'll have pastors available to help you with that decision. Maybe you're here this morning and the Spirit's working in your life in a different way, and perhaps you need to recommit your life or rededicate your life to Christ, recognizing that there's just some distance between where you need to be and where you are in following the Lord. Or maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know, we've been coming to church here for a while, and we're ready to, to commit on a different level to be part of this congregation, not because it's the best church in town, or not because we have the best, church, best pastor around, but because I think this is where God wants me to be, and I'm all in. So maybe you want to come and become a member of Linwood. All those things will be available to you as opportunities as you come. Let's pray. We'll ask God to help us during this time of invitation. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us, calling us, commanding us to join you in service. And Lord, we recognize that as we serve others, we grow. We understand what it means to, to follow you in a way that's fully committed. God, I pray that you'd help each of us as we've heard your word to respond appropriately, whatever level that means. Father, we give this time to you and pray that you'd be glorified in it. In Christ's name, amen.